Thank you very much, folks. Welcome to the PID webinar. We are on a quest to use our COVID days well to understand the world, to understand Pakistan. Well, it's good, keeps us honest, keeps us out of trouble. So we will continue to do that. Uh, we are returning to a subject of COVID, which we haven't taken up for the last month or two, I guess. Um, I think it's an important subject to return to, given that it's a second wave and given that things are beginning to uh, re-emerge that may keep us locked in for some time. Um, how will the world look after the pandemic? We are all guessing, we are all um, watching, we are all wondering, and quite frankly, the answers that come out are not very satisfactory. So today, we, what we've done is we've assembled a very good panel to try and talk about this subject, to try and see what we can learn from the post-pandemic world, which will vary in many different ways, as far as I can see. Um, well, I shouldn't say I can see, I can't see anything. As far as commentators are concerned, commentators tell me the world will change radically. So I'm willing to believe the commentators. So we have with us today, our eminent panel, Malia Lodi, I don't think she needs an introduction. I guess none of our panelists need an introduction, but for the sake of form, I will do an introduction because it's also important to do that, I guess. Malia Lodi, former ambassador, probably uh, the only Pakistan diplomat who's done three, all three, a hat trick, London, uh, Washington, and New York. The UN, uh, US ambassadorship and UK, she's done all three, plus an academic, plus an editor. So he's got many things to her credit, as well as, a, I would say, one of our leading commentators. So always good to hear from Maliha. Welcome, Maliha. Then we've got Harun Sharif, uh, um, former Minister of Investment, as well as a well-known uh, figure in Pakistani circles, academic and otherwise. Always um, got excellent views and good thoughts, so Harun Sharif. And I must also um, thank Harun Sharif for arranging this. He is the person who should be given credit for masterminding this. So um, I believe in giving due credit. So Harun should be given due credit for putting this excellent panel together and giving us an opportunity to learn about the post pandemic world. Then we've got Anatole Levin, um, Georgetown professor now, another well known guy wrote a famous book called Pakistan, a hard country. Now he's written a book on climate change, which um, is also beginning to make an impact. Um, so we've got three eminent panelists who are going to talk about the post-colonial, post-COVID, not post-colonial, post-COVID world. Let's see what the world looks like after COVID, something that we all have at the back and the front of our mind. We are constantly thinking when we emerge from our bunkers what the world will look like. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Maliha Lodi. Ms. Lodi, please go ahead. Let me start by thanking um, uh, Nadeem ul Haq, who's been an energetic and dynamic head of PAID. I had uh, the good fortune of being on PAID's uh, advisory board, or something that used to exist a long time ago. So that was almost 100 years ago. So it's good to be back. <laughs> it's good to be back at PAID. And of course, it's always a pleasure to be a co-panelist with- uh, never, never say that because I didn't count beyond 39 mil here. <laughs> Anatole is here. Welcome, from Anatole has which joined. Is, which is great. So let me, uh, without further ado, I mean, of course, thank you for having me. But uh, let me start by giving a broad overview uh, of what the, what the world looks like today um, and identifying some of the broad features of the pre-COVID international environment, which I argue the pandemic has only reinforced. We can also then from this extrapolate and see uh, what the post-pandemic world is going to look like because um, it is going to be marked by the same five features uh, that have been characterizing the global environment even the, in the pre-pandemic uh, phase. Of course, I chose five but this is not an exhaustive list. It could be seven, it could be five, it could be nine. But the first and obvious one, and I think sometimes you need to state the obvious, is of course rising multipolarity with power being diffused vertically and horizontally between countries and within countries as citizens become more empowered by more accessible, cheaper technologies. 
So global power, as we all know, especially economic power, uh, continues to be redistributed, while state power also continues to be eroded by the greater influence of non-state actors, both good and bad. Uh, we are in a world where no single power has the ability to achieve outcomes on its own. It can only do so in conjunction with or with the cooperation of other states. Uh, and I think one of the features of the pandemic is it's probably the first global crisis since the Second World War in which we have not seen any US leadership. In fact, it has been, there's been an absence of US leadership. There's been an absence of the US, in fact, uh, other than being one of the most affected countries by the COVID-19 pandemic. The second feature uh, of the international envir environment is, of course, the resurgence of competition and tensions between the big powers. I have never called them great powers because I think greatness comes from conduct and not size. So I will continue to call them big parts. The US-China uh, confrontation has become the most consequential geopolitical development, I think, uh, which is going to influence and shape the world uh, in the years to come. So we see uh, the outbreak of trade and tech wars pre-pandemic. And of course, this is going to continue. Uh, competition we see also in uh, advanced technology, and that too has been intensifying. As you all know, trade and political tensions that I just referred to preceded the pandemic, but they're now at a record high with President uh, Donald Trump of the United States using hostile rhetoric and actions against China, and of course, China uh, pushing back. This is uh, election year in America, but I will return to this in a minute. The third uh, feature or characteristic is the retreat from multilateralism and a rule-based international order. We are witnessing the renunciation of international agreements and treaties. Uh, in fact, the pandemic, I mean, here's the paradox. Uh, the pandemic created the need for greater international solidarity and cooperation. But what we saw was quite the opposite, where there was an absence of such international solidarity, much less collaboration. There is a long list, of course, of treaties that the US has renounced, and I'll just mention a few. Uh, the outstanding ones are the Iranian uh, nuclear deal, uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, I'm sure Anatole will talk more about that, the INF, the Inter Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement, and of course, more recently, the Open Skies Agreement that Trump walked out of. But the US has also walked out of uh, key multilateral institutions such as the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva and WHO more recently. I think the fourth feature or characteristic is the rise of popular, or not popular, I don't know how popular they are actually, the rise of populist leaders and those that are being described as strong men, although I don't know how much they, they, they deserve the description of being strong men, but these are people or leaders who act unilaterally and with impunity, and who show disdain for international norms, and who seek to rewrite the rules of the game, either in the world, if they can manage that, or in their own regions. Uh, of course, we have the most grim example of this in our own region, uh, with Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, taking brutal and illegal actions, not just in occupied Jammu and Kashmir, but within India, uh, in pursuing the kind of communi communal politics uh, that he has been. But elsewhere too, what this is doing is injecting greater volatility to an already unstable world. The fifth characteristic or feature, if I could call it that, is of course the emergence of anti-globalization sentiment. Now there are many factors behind this and we can examine this later, but certainly this is being leveraged by certain leaders in the West to reject the existing trading regimes because they find that they cannot compete anymore. Uh, but again, the pandemic has strengthened the sentiment. In fact, the pandemic has reinforced all these global fault lines, if I can call them that. Uh, there are now US threats to leave WTO, while the UN, the United Nations, which is now going to be, it's approaching its 75th uh, anniversary since its founding, which is a 
you know, it's a historic moment. But in this fraught situation, the UN has been under great strain with the main UN agency dealing with the health crisis, WHO, coming under uh, attack by Donald Trump and the United States and some of the allies of the US. And of course, the United States has, as it calls it, defunded WHO and walked out of it. There is also uh, some thinking, in fact, serious thinking uh, that we you know, are following in Western countries, not all Western countries, but many, about remaking global supply chains. Uh, and this seems to reflect their intent to reduce their dependence on China and plans are being considered to move towards setting up local hubs of manufacture and supply. And of course, you know, this is easier said than done. Uh, you cannot overnight change a global uh, supply chains. So going forward, I think what we can expect to see is greater protectionism and trade and possibly travel restrictions, uh, which means that this is going to be a likely reversal of many aspects of globalization. Uh, you know, this is taking it backwards in, in some aspects. Of course, some of globalization you can't stop, uh, but some you can, you can put restrictions. And I think right-wing populist leaders will use the health crisis to reinforce their policy preference for closed borders and come down uh, against uh, immigration uh, and the freer movement of labor that we've seen uh, in recent decades. Now, of course, the future course of the most important bilateral relationship of our century, which is between China and the United States, will have a huge impact, as I said before, on the global economy, uh, as well as on the international order and multilateral institutions. This strained relationship has been variously described by, by many as a new Cold War, the end of the post-1979 era, a geopolitical turning point, and less seriously, uh, as the economists put it, a scold war uh, with the two sides, you know, trading uh, accusations and allegations as the pandemic uh, broke. So the question I think that we can also address ourselves to is whether these two global powers will arrive at some kind of a modus vivendi, uh, or will their standoff become a more enduring feature uh, of the global landscape? Uh, and how much of this China bashing uh, in the US reflects campaign politics? Uh, or is the friction an inevitable response to the rise of a new global power by an older global power, which is a classic phenomena that we've seen throughout history when power dynamics begin to shift uh, fundamentally. So President Trump has already announced that he wants to do, uh, carry out an economic decoupling. Uh, but as far as China is concerned, uh, its interest lies, as it's always said, in its peaceful rise and therefore in de-escalating tensions and steadying relations with the United States. But we've seen that there are limits and there will be limits in the future to uh, China's forbearance in the face of offensive US actions. There is fresh thinking in Beijing about how to deal with the more antagonistic Washington. And there is growing nationalist sentiment that their country should push back against Western criticism and US bullying. And this sentiment is already driving a more assertive uh, Asia policy. Now, we all know that China is expected to emerge as the world's largest economy in a decade. And this should be enough to persuade the United States and its Western allies that engagement is necessary in their own interest with a country that will be pivotal to post-pandemic global recovery, as well as addressing a host of other international challenges. But this rational calculation, and also the fact that China remains Washington's biggest lender, may not be enough to overcome US nervousness or anxiety about the challenge posed by America's global position by China's rise. So a key factor that may shape uh, future relations uh, will be the US presidential election this November, uh, when the next occupant of the White House will have to decide uh, whether he wants to pursue engagement with China or embark on a long drawn out confrontation. But in both eventualities, a return to engagement that previously characterized relations with China is highly unlikely. 
I think irrespective of who wins public opinion in America, as well as congressional opinion, there is a political consensus. It seems uh, that standing up to China is what the people of America want. This seems to be the message coming out. Um, and I think this has been found obviously by President Trump's uh, rhetoric and actions, but there is a general consensus that sees China uh, as an adversary that has exploited the US on trade and poses a strategic challenge. And I think even if we're looking at a possible Biden victory, many of Biden's uh, foreign policy advisors happen to be hawks on China. And I think there'll be limits uh, to what a possible Biden presidency will be able to do in turning away uh, from the kind of policies that were pursued uh, by President Trump. So I don't see a huge difference vis-a-vis -vis China. There may be difference of uh, tone, um, but I'm not too sure uh, the trade and tech wars that are now underway uh, are going to change very fundamentally. So let me round off by saying that we are, I think, possibly in one of history's most unsettled periods uh, in international relations uh, with an atomization of the international system uh, taking place. Uh, this is uncharted territory. Uh, we have not been here before. So there's multipolarity, retreat from multilateralism, just when you need multilateralism. And of course, as I said, the two big powers uh, are engaged uh, in a standoff uh, whose outcome we don't know, but which will impact uh, on the entire world. Now, specifically uh, for Pakistan, I won't go into any of uh, you know, the implications for Pakistan, but clearly uh, there are strategic, political, economic implications for every country, but especially for Pakistan. Uh, which seeks good relations with both countries, but also Pakistan is clear that its strategic future lies with China. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Malia. That is a very interesting and a very good overview. Tough times for us, of course, uh, in the middle of the China-US, I won't say war, but a cold war that's emerging, as to use your term, and also the new multilateral and global protection that's rising. And well, we'll benefit from one thing. We were never in the global supply chain, so we'll be okay on that score. So there are good things to being, you know, if you don't go to a party, you don't get drunk. So it's okay. So it's good thing. So Haroon, can you please go ahead and give us your views and tell us how Pakistan and this region, you are a specialist in regional uh, stuff. So how do you think this region and we can cope? Haroon, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Once again, many, many thanks for organizing it. And I'm glad that all three panelists could join. And excellent global overview we have just heard from Malia Lodi. I think I will try and focus on three things just to follow on what's being said in the regional and Pakistani context by using more economic and political economy lens uh, to look at the regional you know, dynamics which will emerge uh, uh, in the post-pandemic world, or actually, I don't know it's post-pandemic, or it is living with the pandemic world, because both, you know, ideas are being talked about. So three, four things. Uh, first of all, tough times economically, uh, but the most predictions, as you, most of you have seen, that in 2020, Asia's growth is between 1% to 2%, but it is all projected to rebound in 2021 in the average rate of 6%. Mm -hmm. So which is an interesting thing that it's one difficult year and it is predicted that it will rebound. <clears throat> On the regional side from globalization to regional or sub-regional analysis, I think that trend was emerging already. As some of you know that for six years I was the regional advisor in the World Bank. So we were seeing this trend that it was happening. But what it has done now is that perhaps, you know, like countries like China will eventually, you know, go more bilateral and say goodbye to multilateralism if the same trend continues and intensity of, you know, <clears throat> this Cold War goes on. By the way, uh, I'm working with Peking University and China outright rightly rejects the Cold War word. They don't even use it. But at this point in time, they have started at least retaliating to it in much stronger verbal and written form. Mm -hmm. Third thing I would specifically speak about is that Belt and Road Initiative itself, 
in my opinion, there will be a slowdown, but it will remain China's flagship, but it will change its shape uh, according to the global realities and regional realities. So let me go one by one very quickly uh, uh, in these areas. <clears throat> so globalization versus regional cooperation, uh, most analyses and most rational thinkers have pred predicted that because of COVID, you know, uh, 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 Oh, so we got the slide. So if we could go to slide two, please. Yeah, here. So, no, next slide. So what I'm trying to say is that regional cooperation makes imminent sense, uh, but I think the politics is turning more toxic, uh, more nationalistic, as Malia has also mentioned, and more polarized. So what it means is that where we had thought some positive notes in the region, like UAE and Kuwait helping Iran a bit, Saudi Arabia going a bit soft on you know, Yemen, but what happened in the case of India and Pakistan and the US and China, it has basically clean board all that thinking. So the rational thinking on regional cooperation is actually being, you know, uh, uh, really there are lots of barriers being created uh, by the politics. Uh, I see high levels of debt in the region, uh, countries like Pakistan and others. Even in the Europe, I just read that UK has borrowed 45 billion uh, uh, pounds last year. Uh, countries like Pakistan will find it increasingly difficult to strike a balance between China and the US. <clears throat> and that I'm already sensing in terms of both economic and diplomacy. Although at the moment, you know, we are dealing with multiple players, uh, but I, I would not be surprised that in next year or two post pandemic, a time comes the tilt goes either way, because if you read what the US is saying and even the, you know, Alice Wells recent uh, tweets. So there is a pressure on China to rethink the CPAC relationship. And I know for sure that, you know, China is also looking at it. Changes in flow of people and goods, we have already spoken, but the point I'm trying to make is in the, so the regional connectivity makes more sense when lesser number of people will travel globally. So the countries which are connected physically uh, will have a proximity advantage. This is the old concept of new economic geography, but that's what I think in the, uh, I, I now define the regionalism is the China, Pakistan, West and Central Asia, because on the eastern side, you know, uh, a different block is emerging. So I think proximity could be an advantage, but so far Pakistan has failed to use the advantage of proximity. Let's see where CPEC, you know, takes up. Uh, final thing on that is on the regional thing, I see more and more, you know, these regional funds and sovereign wealth funds trying to diversify from traditional markets of the US and Europe. And they are looking for both India, Pakistan, other economies here. Uh, uh, to, so that stake is rising. So, so diversification of investment funds uh, is, could be an opportunity uh, for the region. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a reminder. This is the China's growth trajectory. So how it went down and this year around 1%. But 2021, most projections are projecting you know, almost 9%. So that, you know, economists wrote a major piece on that, that is China winning. So I don't think it's about winning and losing, but certainly it will give China a stronger position uh, uh, post pandemic years. Next slide, please. <coughs> Next. So let's, let's look at BRI. So number of projections have been made by China and others on the future of Belt and Road Initiative. I'm also working on it with, you know, two companies and also with Peking University. If we look at the left-hand pie, that's the Belt and Road Initiative today. So where, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is about 28%, uh, Southeast Asia is second, followed by Latin America, South Asia, and North Africa. So I looked at about six scenarios and, you know, one of the scenario, which is more linked to the supply chain relocation, which was indicated in the previous presentation. So what there are three, four trends I want to highlight here, if you look at the pie on the right carefully. So what happens is I think China will diversify, they have already started diversifying and relocating 
the productivity hubs and the supply chain networks, but clearly it's moving more towards the safer economies, uh, the more uh, 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 affluential economies like you know Southeast Asia. So I do see the share of Africa and share of conflict countries, share of South Asia actually going down. And China's share is likely to increase in economies like Latin America, economies like Southeast Asia, economies like Europe will come into play, the Eastern Europe and other. So that's where the thinking in China is going. China is getting more and more risk averse, but China wants to go ahead. And if you look uh, at the lower side of the slide, their focus will remain on power sector, manufacturing and railways. So what does it mean? It actually means that, you know, very core business, which they know well, but they will pick up different sort of regions where they can quickly, you know, establish these linkages. So about several scenarios, I just wanted to pose this one, which I thought was more appropriate for today's discussion. Final slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so what's happening is that I, Jen, although China has been respecting the multilateral system for years and talking, you know, going, abiding by the rules of the game, but I do see internally voices coming up that, you know, if we don't get seat on the table, so we should strengthen our multilateral and local financing systems at the regional level. And I wouldn't be surprised that we see larger investments by Chinese banks in the region independent of the multilateral system. There is a pressure on China on bilateral debt restructuring. And I think they will do it, but they will do it quietly, unlike the G20 did. But the non-performing loans in the partner countries in Belt and Road Initiatives is likely to increase. Uh, I spoke to the head of Exim Bank in China uh, they are worried about their portfolio, which is likely to get non-performing. So they are at the moment looking at restructuring their debts, you know. Uh, as I said, you know, they are focusing more on infrastructure and strategic investments. And that very clearly I have recently seen in Pakistan with the new CPEC authority, again, you know, highlighting uh, the railway tracks, Gawadar, you know, hydropower. So I think the focus, China will get, you know, more infrastructure contracts from strategic partners to reposition itself. But what does it mean? It actually means is that their focus on medium and small enterprises, economic zones, industrial cooperation, agriculture will go down. Now that is something which has a strategic importance for Pakistan, that if we keep on doling out infrastructure contracts to a neighboring country, uh, then, you know, the old arguments of West about you know uh, uh, the climate change and about the debt structures will reemerge and it will put us in a little difficult you know position. Uh, digital BRI has emerged as a priority in China, and all the big giants like Huawei's and Alibaba's and others are repositioning for more and more digital connectivity in the region. And Chinese private banking sector has been asked to you know look regional. Uh, because China is trying to look at higher degree of resources, and these resources cannot come uh, uh, from the traditional Chinese state-owned banking system. And that will have, you know, a different uh, uh, meaning uh, to the future regional connectivity. Uh, so two, three messages, and I'll end. I, as I've said that if one is expecting that China will expand a lot in South Asia, uh, in the near future, it is unlikely. Although there's a very important point to note that the bilateral trade between China and India is already touching almost 90 to 100 billion. So the stakes have gone very high in the past five years. Although the balance is tilted toward China where 70 billion is China's exports to India and about 15 billion they import, but stake is high. I know for sure because I've been talking to them, Saudi Arabia is making investments with China and without China in India and looking for Pakistan. So one of the trend I see post pandemic is that the regional money will look for houses within the region, but how ready the region is, 
to absorb that money and take it forward will remain a question. One of the rational thinking is that if more stakes are coming in the region, so will conflict go down? In the near future, unlikely, but maybe in the longer term when the stakes go to a level, people will be forced to think and traditional economies will shrink. And finally, I think Anatole will talk about more, but I don't see China coming into uh, uh, countries like Afghanistan or Iran, the conflict and you know difficult economies in near future. That's a very clear outcome of the shift which I'm seeing post pandemic. So with all that, my summary is that this particular region is likely to get more and more influenced by China, but the tool of economic diplomacy will be traditional uh, infrastructure, power, railways type investments. Uh, the lending profiles might change. Uh, how will the countries like Pakistan balance ourselves in terms of that we are heavily indebted to multilateral system? Uh, that would be one of the major, major challenges in the coming days. So with that, I will stop and obviously we'll take questions. Thank you, Arun. A very good overview. <clears throat> We've, uh, we are entering into a tough situation. Um, even China may have find it difficult to invest in Pakistan. So there are a number of things that you've raised, which are very important to hear. But let me turn to Anatole. Anatole, you're in Georgetown. You're a neighbor of our favorite person, Mr. Donald Trump. And uh, obviously, you will have something to say about the, the country that you are now living in or are adopted. But at the same time, do, don't forget, you wrote about Pakistan, the hard country. So please tell us what your perspectives are on the hard country being able to go through this COVID change in the world. And then your latest incarnation, you've got climate change now. Now, COVID has cleared out the climate. So that's one good thing that COVID has done. Climate has improved. So how do you link all these three, three thing, things together, uh, Anatole, in this post-COVID world? Please, Anatole, forum is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here, if only virtually. Um, I mean, to follow on from uh, what uh, Malia and Haroon said, uh, I'm afraid that I regard uh, greater tension between China and the USA now as an inevitability. Uh, I hope not um, uh, you know, amounting to a new Cold War, as the new stereotype has it. Uh, but if you look at the situation in Washington, D.C., there is now a consensus in the U.S. foreign and security establishment. And when you get a bipartisan consensus of that kind in Washington, uh, as we have seen previously, as we still see in the case of Israel and so forth, it, it, it is very, very difficult to break. I mean, people who criticize it are basically banished to the, the fringes and ignored. And if you look at Biden himself, his record, if you look at his, his team, uh, they, well, they are old, cold, old, you know, old cold warriors from the old days, look at their age, um, and uh, they are just as committed to an anti-Chinese strategy as is Donald Trump. Uh, possibly, I mean, in a, a more consistent and even more dangerous way. Uh, I fear that there will also be strong if, well, actually not unconscious, uh, some, some of this has now been stated explicitly, uh, desire to, to adopt a, a classical strategy of distracting attention from domestic problems by, in, in the USA, by accentuating external threats, in this case, China. Now, on the Chinese side, uh, the, the Chinese have made some unwise moves, I would say. Um, the seizure of the islands in the South China Sea, even if in fact Chinese claims are no more exaggerated than those of Vietnam, but coupled with China's colossal economic and military rise has certainly caused um, considerable anxiety, not just in Washington, but in Southeast Asia as well. Um, and that did not go well with China's peaceful rise. Uh, some of Chinese diplomacy has also been extremely inept. Um, frankly, in the coronavirus crisis, they would have done better simply to keep quiet and allow 
the United States to discredit itself. Um, the, um, the, the rhetoric and the conspiracy theories of certain Chinese officials have, to put it mildly, not helped the, um, the international situation. Now, that said, um, and to echo what Malia said before, uh, China outside the South China Sea has, and Harun said this as well, has in fact been extremely cautious in geopolitical terms. Um, it has, even when uh, there were actual you know, invitations from the US, as in the case of Afghanistan, to play a bigger role, uh, the Chinese have you know, really, really held back from that. Uh, the, um, you know, the, the string of pearls in strategy in the Indian Ocean is continually portrayed by uh, the Indian media and sections of the US media as a military strategy. But of course, as we all know, it isn't. Potentially, perhaps, in future. But so far, this is not a military strategy. It's a commercial one. Uh, perhaps most striking is, is the Middle East, because, of course, the, um, uh, the, the monstrous failings of US policy in the Middle East over the past, well, more than two generations now, um, has created enormous opportunities for the Chinese uh, to play a, a, a role uh, in um, embarrassing the US, worsening America's problems. In fact, the Chinese have done none of that. I mean, they have stuck to what they view as principled positions against intervention and in support of the Iran nuclear deal. Um, but it's very striking that uh, they have really held back. It's Russia that has pushed forward again in the region. Uh, and so, so far from the Chinese side, this does not resemble a Cold War. You know, during the Cold War, um, the Soviet Union did its best uh, to embarrass and attack US interests all over the world, you know, from Central America, South America, China. And of course, that was also because, critically, uh, the Soviet Union was a revolutionary power, you know, dedicated to the overthrow of most state and economic systems uh, around the world. China is not. And um, despite, you know, the, uh, the, the tremendous attempts now, uh, not just in, in America, but also among you know, those people in Europe, uh, establishment people who are passionately anxious to keep the U.S. alliance. You have more and more language about China as a revisionist power, as a threat to democracy and so on. Um, Ch China is not a, a, a disruptive political actor of that kind. Um, and so in that sense, it won't resemble the Cold War. However, uh, if one looks now at the consequences of the coronavirus, um, ideologically, I think what one will certainly see is, well, obviously a, a tremendous discrediting of the US model. Um, you know, the, the US form of democracy has taken a, a tremendous blow, or rather another tremendous blow, because, you know, Trump's election already did that, and much of what Trump has done. Um, whether this will increase support for authoritarianism as such um, is a little bit unclear, uh, because, I mean, if you look at the pattern of how well states have responded to the pandemic, uh, it's obvious that the East Asians have done far, far better than anyone else. Uh, but then, of course, that uh, includes not just authoritarian China and semi-authoritarian Singapore, but also democratic South Korea and Taiwan. So the real criterion seems to be uh, the possession of an effective, legitimate state, um, a state that can get things done effectively and which enjoys the trust of its population, whether of an authoritarian kind or a democratic kind. Where that will take the world in future, I'm not sure. But I think, you know, ever since the end of the Cold War, or e even earlier, um, there has been this tendency, not just in the West, but among people elsewhere in the world as well, who identify with the West, um, to use democracy or democratization as a formula or shorthand 
for reform and improvement of, of every kind. I think we'll, and one saw, um, you know, in the US interventions in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, how this language was allowed to completely obliterate serious ideas of you know, reform and state competence. So I think from now on, there will be a lot more thinking about state efficiency as a goal. And the US model will become less and less attractive. Now, however, there much depends, well, on two things. The, the first is obviously the depth and the length of the economic crisis stemming from the pandemic. Uh, now, Haroon is the expert here, um, and there are, of course, economists, and, you know, with some arguments, if one looks at what's been happening in various places, uh, that we will see a, a V-shaped world recovery, uh, a steep uh, drop, followed by a rapid recovery. Uh, but, of course, others have pointed not just the possibility of a fresh wave of the pandemic, but also the multiple weaknesses uh, in Western economies and the US economy in particular. Um, the fragility of financial institutions, not as deep as before 2008, perhaps, uh, but still, I mean, very, very marked, uh, and the weakness of the economic fundamentals. Um, it does seem to me, certainly if the figures presented by Harun are correct, um, that China will play an even greater role than it did in 2008 in a global economic recovery, uh, that the US will to a considerable extent be absent from this, uh, and that this is bound in turn to increase Chinese influence and power. Now, when it comes to the nature of the recovery, um, there is, of course, increasing talk in many countries and in Europe, to some extent, action, uh, that this should take the form of a green New Deal. Um, in other words, Franklin Roosevelt's program of the 1930s of industrial regeneration social solidarity, but now also with an ecological face, the, the move away from carbon fuels to alternative energy. Uh, the, and I mean, certainly when it comes to the need to rebuild social solidarity, um, in Europe, this has been extremely marked. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. The other day, um, Boris Johnson, the Conservative Prime Minister of Britain, uh, had to reassure his own hardline conservative MPs that I am not a communist. Um, I don't think anyone had ever suspected him of being a communist. But of course, this is in the context of Johnson now, at least rhetorically, uh, launching this tremendous New Deal program, explicitly you know, referring to the New Deal of the 1930s. Um, now, in Britain, there is a certain element uh, of um, you know, the, the, the battle against climate change. It's much stronger, of course, in, um, in France, to some, some extent Germany and elsewhere in Europe. In America, of course, this is totally on who wins in November. But not only on that, because as we have seen again and again, to get anything done in America, you don't just have to win the presidency you have to win the Senate, and you have to win the Senate by a sufficiently large majority, also that you can overrule your own dissidents, you know, and of course, in the Democratic Party, you know, however long they spend on their knees apologizing for, for racism, and um, that isn't going to stop them reflecting, you know, private interests and sectional economic interests when it comes to serious economic reform. That's the way they operate. Um, so you need to win the Senate. You need to keep the Senate because, as we saw with Obama, if you lose it halfway through, your, your legislative program is wrecked. And you have to win at least twice in order to pack the Supreme Court with your nominees. Because otherwise, as we've seen, the Supreme Court will simply veto 
um, progressive legislation if it retains a, a Republican majority. Um, so that uh, there are tremendous challenges in the United States to um, the kind of economic recovery which would both play uh, a serious part in the battle against climate change, uh, but which would also restore the image of America as a dynamic um, economy and a dynamic society in the world. Now, elsewhere, both when it comes to the struggle against climate change, but also more generally, the greatest challenge, of course, is frankly increased poverty. On the one hand, uh, we have seen states going in for a degree of borrowing, which would have been simply inconceivable only six months ago. Um, but uh, at the same time, that obviously creates real worries uh, about indebtedness. And elsewhere in the world, much poorer countries with less of an ability to borrow, um, the action against climate change will be greatly restricted simply by the fact that places are going to be a lot poorer and less willing to create public discontent by demanding sacrifices of their populations. We've already seen the backlash against such completely justified moves as Macron's fuel tax. Now, that was when the French economy was doing pretty well. Uh, trying to introduce measures like that when people are really suffering economically will be extremely difficult. And in China, we have already seen how um, the tremendous economic dip this year uh, has, I hope temporarily, but um, certainly markedly, reduced Chinese willingness to push ahead with the transition from fossil fuels. Um, dependence on coal has gone up again, um, or at least the, the progress on that has definitely stopped. So um, there, I think the signs so far are mixed as far as the, the battle against climate change is concerned. But the other thing that, of course, we can almost certainly expect um, as a result of the, the economic crisis, I mean, and the extent will depend on the length and depth of the crisis, is greater political instability in many parts of the world. Uh, now, um, th this in some cases could be good. Um, we can hope, of course, that uh, Narendra Modi might, his popularity might suffer as a result and a number of other unpleasant people around the world. Uh, but a lot of other governments as well are undoubtedly going to suffer badly as a result. Um, and this could in certain areas cause a new wave of massive instability, if one remembers how the Arab Spring, and what I have to say, with very few exceptions, were its disastrous results for the region, uh, you know, were brought about by um, basically economic poverty and suffering. And of course, if you see um, increased political instability in many parts of the world, uh, it would take, um, great restraint on the part of, uh, of Beijing not, I think, to try to turn some of this in an anti-American direction. I hope that the Chinese won't, um, and I think it's not certain that they will. Um, years ago, I, I asked a, a Chinese diplomat whether they were tempted to exploit America's difficulties in the Middle East, and his reply was, absolutely not. Why on earth should we get involved in that mess? You know, look what involvement in the Middle East has done to the United States, how it has damaged you know, the US. And also, he said, we have no solution. We have no, no formula for helping that region. So we're going to keep out. I hope very much that they stick to that, because indeed, um, the U United States has not benefited from US involvement in the Middle East, and nor has anyone else. Thank you. You need to unmute the mm. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Anatol. That was a very nice, very good overview all the way from China to the regional and to the global even climate change. I think that's a wonderful overview. Let me ask a few, a few, a few questions before I throw it out um, to the floor. Um, you all seem to suggest, and I think one can agree, that the world is becoming fragmented, protectionism on the, on the rise, uh, fragmentation of various kinds is happening, uh, the US-China relationship, the regional situation, and I think more importantly, even how we've dealt with COVID will also lead to fragmentation. For example, is it likely that countries like Pakistan, which may not have dealt with COVID as well as other countries, will they, some countries be frozen out? Will they not be? But the more important issue still is the issue of the economics, which is closer to my heart. Everybody is highly indebted, but some of us can't afford it, others can. And we, in sitting here, Anatole, the hard country, uh, we are born of the drug of aid and debt. And we have aid and debt in our veins, and we rely on the fund. We are even now going through a fund program. But we are not alone, large part of Africa. Many countries are going through it. So given this, now tell me, multilateral institutions are seeking, as Malia says, kind of a decline. And there has to be renegotiation. How do you see the world emerging now from the point of view of us, the poor countries? Uh, so far, you've masterfully displayed what's going to happen between US and China. Put yourself in the perspective of a poor country and tell us what's going to happen. So who would like to go first? Malia, Anatole, Harun, whoever. Go ahead. Anatole, why don't you start? Then we'll go to Malia. OK. Well, um, once again, it, it depends on the depth of the economic crisis. Um, I mean, th that is, in the short to medium term, the critical thing. Mm -hmm. Um, beyond that, uh, I think it, there will be less money around. Now, one thing that will be very interesting to see is whether as part of this new tension or increased tension between the US and China, uh, the US once again becomes much more generous with its foreign aid, which of course has declined radically over the past two generations. Um, and of course that also implies uh, greater generosity in lending money on easier terms. Uh, and whether China does so. Um, now, my sense would be but this is the kind of issue where the talk of a new Cold War will run into basic American political reality and political attitudes and wallets, frankly. Um, and that this will expose the fact that this Cold War is, Cold War talk is to a considerable extent, not entirely, basically, you know, an American elite program, a foreign security elite program. Yes, I mean, when it comes to protectionism, there is public support. Uh, I have found little appetite in the American public for another massive program of sacrifice and effort for geopolitical ends. Um, you know, the, the overstretch of the Bush administration, you know, the repeated failures of foreign intervention have really knocked spots off that kind of feeling. Um, but we'll see. Uh, on the Chinese side, uh, the Chinese, of course, have also been pretty cautious and pretty tough on that, as Pakistan mm -hmm. has discovered. Um, you know, the, the, the Chinese are pretty insistent um, on the need you know to show that you that you know china will will lend money or invest money but the country that receives it has to be able to use it effectively or of course to give china things that it really wants but once again i mean if china is drawn into a world struggle with the us uh, then essentially china will simply go out to try to buy allies, you know, as was the case during the Cold War. I think that the, um, the, the, the jury is still out on that one. Mm. Um, 
what I hope is in Pakistan and elsewhere that this new economic situation will focus the attention of elites, if they're capable of paying attention, on the need for effective reform and the strengthening of states. Because one of my main points you know, in my, my book about Pakistan, and a point that I've made again and again and again and again, is that the root that the most important root cause of Pakistani state weakness, the inability of the state to perform essential tasks, is exactly the same as it has been for, thousands, for states over thousands of years. It's the inability to raise domestic revenue. You know, it is the appallingly low proportion of GDP, which is raised in taxes, of course, quite apart from what happens to the taxes once they've been raised. So um, faced with this new economic crisis, um, I would hope that um, you know, people will draw the, the, the lessons from the, the pandemic about the need to build state efficiency. But whether they will or not, well, you know better than me. So Malia, with migration now not a possibility, with debt very high, with less multilateral support, and in between US and China, what are the options for Pakistan or even beyond Pakistan, even the poor countries? Are we entering a phase where poverty is going to increase and poor countries are just going to have to suffer? You know, uh, Nadeem, like you, um, like you, I've long been an advocate of uh, getting, can you hear me? You, you can hear me, right? We can hear mm -hmm. you fine, yeah. Okay. I've long been an advocate of uh, kicking mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. it's not a habit, it's an addiction mm -hmm. that our ruling elite mm -hmm. has to borrowing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and therefore that has always created a perverse incentive to do exactly what Anatole is talking about, something that I've written about for decades. Uh, to you know, mobilize domestic uh, resources and uh, raise uh, revenue. Uh, you know, I recently wrote something on foreign policy, and I said, you know, the one thing that Pakistan learned after the war in 1971 was to rely on itself for its defense. It followed a strategic uh, option, acquired the strategic capability to deter aggression, and was able to therefore assure itself of its defense to the extent that any state can assure itself. But on the economic mm -hmm. front, we've seen the opposite happening. Mm -hmm. Rather than pursue a path to economic independence, mm -hmm. uh, Pakistan has engaged in foreign policy in the past and its alignments have led to uh, the kind of uh, sort of borrowing addiction uh, and the addiction in reliance on external resources uh, that we, we're unable to shake off. So I think, you know, another feature I think of the, of the world during the pandemic has been very much each country for itself. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see more of it in the post pandemic uh, period also. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly countries will have to focus on themselves. Uh, that's understandable to be able to get out of a health crisis that continues until a vaccine is found. And of course mm -hmm. it's economic fallout, which is huge for everyone. Uh, you know, obviously for developing countries, it's, it's much greater in terms of what Nadeem mentioned, which is more people being pushed into uh, poverty uh, and the salaried middle class also seeing uh, their income eroded in a very fundamental uh, way. Um, unemployment, uh, rising unemployment. So, I mean, there are going to be an explosive set of social issues uh, that will result uh, from the economic downturn, which is going to be a prolonged one. Mm -hmm. Now in this, uh, I think what is needed really is someone to show leadership in our country, uh, where you don't look towards another, you know, you don't rush to a Middle Eastern capital uh, to ask for more money, uh, you know, which has been the case in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, you know, there've been air dashes uh, to one or other uh, capital uh, in the Middle East uh, to help us shore up our reserves uh, of a balance of payment support. Now, if you carry on like this at a time when the global economy is going to contract anyway, 
there's going to be less available. So I think, you know, the moral of the story or the lesson that has to be learned is this is the moment for reform. This is the moment that you have to turn around to your people and say, just as we have acquired the independence in our strategic realm, we want to acquire economic independence. And for that, everyone must contribute. But I think, you know, that raises one question and I'll end there because I think that's a very fundamental question that is, you know, again, it's something that we see across the world, mm -hmm. which is declining trust between citizens and governments, irrespective of the complexion of the government. And the erosion of trust in traditional institutions or state institutions, uh, I think it's across the world. Uh, some countries have done a little better, but mostly. Now, how do you carry out reform in an environment where trust is, let's say, weak? Uh, you know, you've got to restore that trust. People have to believe that you are doing the right thing and therefore they're willing to contribute because everyone will have to contribute. Uh, if you have to pursue a path of economic independence. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll end there. I think, you know, I, I think this, the, the crisis that we're all, you know, in right now, the ongoing crisis and health emergency and economic crisis, uh, this is not going to go away very soon. And it will require policies which are fundamentally different. It cannot be business as usual in terms of economic policy. Uh, you can't keep looking to the IMF for the next package. You can't keep looking for the traditional donors or to <laughs> Arab capitals, uh, you know, for, for, this, for these funds. You, you've got to do it yourself. So I'll end there. Thank you. Harun, you talked about the gravity model now becoming more important, basically, that we have to rely on our neighborhood. We have to think locally. Um, so I'd like you to reflect on this, that we live in a very troubled neighborhood. The only person, only entity, a country that we can rely on is China. The rest is very difficult. The second thing also, you talked about the Middle Eastern countries. What kind of return migration are we looking at? What kind of remittance impacts are looking at? Because apart from aid and debt, we are also looking at, uh, we also rely on remittances. So we could be in deep trouble if all these things happen simultaneously. So what's, what's your take on all this? Go ahead. Very quickly, uh, a comment on the stress deficit. It's not only local, but also within the region, which we are seeing, you know, very clearly. Uh, and nobody really has the leadership power to convene and bring people together for reforms and, you know, uh, uh, taking, seizing uh, the knowledge partnerships. Now, to your particular question, uh, uh, in the Pakistan context, uh, the debt situation, as you know, we have higher level of domestic debt uh, mm -hmm. as compared to the international debt. But I do see... China's debt rising in Pakistan, particularly in the shape of infrastructure related projects. Uh, so there will be more higher dependence within the region on China, as you have mentioned. Uh, second thing which I see internally is that there will be battle for resources in the coming year. Uh, and very clearly the pie at the center, the taxes cannot feed in. And I see two things happening. Number one, uh, which is a little troublesome politically because convening power is not there. It is the opening up the dialogue on resource distribution between federation and provinces, i.e. the 18th Amendment. I think that is going to be opened pretty soon. Uh, second part in Pakistan is that the, which should be done is the non-tax revenue. Uh, that needs reform uh, where the non-performing assets can be leveraged to, you know, uh, have some revenue streams coming in. I don't see taxation system in the near future going up. Very quickly on the Middle East thing, I have been talking to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and you know UAE in this regard. Uh, and we, we are making a database of people who are coming. So one is that remittances from these countries, the relatively the individual remittances are low because the richer Pakistani is not necessarily remit money from these countries. Uh, it comes from the US comes from the you know uh, European thing that if you look at the number the remittance so far has sustained at the same time countries like Japan are reaching out to Pakistan because there is a shortage of labor and particularly trained people in the Middle East the Japanese ambassador requested that can we have the database so we can import so if Pakistan plays smart so some of the people can be relocated but the, your question linked to the pressure on resources in Pakistan 
unless you know you've got to close down something to gain other thing you need to take very tough decisions and in the political economy sense where i spent a year with the government uh, i don't see that happening for two reasons mm-hmm. a is the uh, 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 actually the expertise the availability of expertise to do it uh, second is the convening power in this intense and you know fragmented situation uh, which is just not there people talk to each other through twitter they talk to each other through media and you just cannot bring together a consensus to take take it forward and that's the leadership question so on that i think higher that from the region uh, 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 i was among the four trips with malia mentioned where we looked for valeso payment sport they are very keen to buy out assets here rather than giving you balance of payment support but for that we need to put our house in order to give them a proper value proposition and that's what i was trying to do but anyway i'm not there so thank you very much what you're saying is that we have to look after ourselves no more sugar daddies that's a very tough way to live i'm not ready for it neither is pakistan but i will not go further in this there are many people who have who want to talk to you so let me not stand in the middle let's start with sana sana go ahead ask your question can i shall, shall i'll club three or four questions and come back to you okay sana bibi bhai sana are you there hello I'm sorry we seem to have lost Sana maybe she can't switch on her mic okay Sana if you can switch on your mic raise your hand again let's go to Aima Aima Oh Sana is here okay Sana go ahead Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum assalam go ahead Sir I want to ask uh, covid is threat to economic globalization so mm-hmm. what will be its impact on CPEX mm-hmm. as okay. ma'am said covid is threat to economic globalization so what right. will be its impact on, on cpec, uh, CPEC? Okay. and pakistan is already facing uh, pakistan is already facing okay. economic and health crisis so That's i want to ask okay good good let's have faiza chana hello ji go ahead i'm a fellow sorry i'm a i'm a you're waiting yeah yeah Uh, hi i have a question i just my question is generally in terms of policy i see a lot of us know what needs to be done and we we see what's wrong but mm-hmm. there's a great discrepancy between what we do what our politicians or what our policy makers do and what mm-hmm. actually we know should be done so why there is such a big gap between what needs to be done and what we actually do okay. why don't we do what needs to be done instead of doing things that are out of the way and we keep deteriorating our economy good good go ahead aima yeah that was my question your, okay, good yeah. good okay go ahead uh, who is there next um okay uh, let's see um, munibur rahman sir assalam alaikum sir uh, my my question is uh, what can be the way forward for pakistan in in this tough uh, scenario okay fair enough fair enough Okay, um, Naimulla Sachi. Assalamualaikum. Can you hear me, sir? We can hear you fine. Uh, sir, Go my ahead. question is, what will be the role of the Pakistan if the uh, tension between the China and the USA increases, and uh, and CPEC is very important for Pakistan? How Pakistan will deal with the USA? Okay, fair the enough. The tension is. if tension okay. is greater between the uh, chain and was usa fair enough fair enough theek hai and what about um, faiza chana then we'll go to the speaker then we'll take another round of questions faiza chana assalam alaikum uh, so my question is that as ma'am maliha said uh, it is necessary to win the trust of the citizens there is a huge trust deficit between citizens and government so mm-hmm. it uh, it is necessary to uh, win the trust before any development either it would be in a health sector or economic sector what are the measures what should be the measures government should take in order to overcome this trust deficit trust deficit situation okay okay so malia why don't you take these questions and we'll go back 
Malia, Malia Lodi. Maybe mute is on. Malia, unmute. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so let me take uh, the last couple of questions, with, and I just was trying to write them down so that I remembered what uh, what was said. I mean, one of the young ladies asked, uh, we know what to do, but why don't we do it? I mean, the answer is two words, political will. Unless you have the political will to, and you believe in what you uh, want yeah. to do. Uh, I mean, you know, I remember when I served abroad, I always used to tell people my country is one of the most overdiagnosed countries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't just overdiagnosed. We knew all the solutions. We know them now. Uh, it's not rocket science. We know exactly what needs to be done to set Pakistan right. Uh, we need economic independence, and that means there are policies that will have to be pursued to achieve that. Uh, we need to invest more in education and health. We need to put human security right on top. Uh, I mean, we have put state security right on top, as much importance has to be given to human security. If the pandemic has shown anything, it is that. So I think political will and a leadership that really believes in it, because this is not something that you know, a donor is going to tell you or, or somebody else is going to tell you. you it's got to come from the heart and the head. Okay. Now, with the other question that somebody asked was about the trust deficit. Uh, you know, that's a tough one because uh, uh, reviving trust is a process. It's not an event. You can't do it by announcing one or two things. You have to do it over a period of time. And the only way you do it is through one, good governance, and two, consensual governance. Mm -hmm. Unilateralism is just as bad internationally as it is domestically. Because any kind of unilateralism means you are excluding many, many people, and you're not building whatever you're trying to do on a bedrock of consensus. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a lesson for the present government also to learn uh, that, you know, uh, it has to work with others. Uh, in any parliamentary democracy, you may get a majority, even though your majority is a coalition in coalition with others, but you have to govern with the consent of your citizens as well as with consensus that you build with other political parties. And I'll end on this note because this is an important point. Let's remember that the last election, opposition parties were able to get a significant portion of the vote, especially in Pakistan's largest province, Punjab. Now, if you exclude those parties, uh, including uh, the uh, government of Sindh, for example, I mean, they won an election there. So, you know, this is to revive trust, you have to revive trust not only amongst your own supporters, you have to revive trust amongst everyone. And therefore, you have to then present yourself and act as a leader of all the country, not just your own party. That is the way. And as I said, it's not easy. It, it, it takes time. It's over a period of time. But I have no doubt that Pakistanis are, you know, a talented people, we are a sensitive people. We are a caring people. I have no doubt that we can do it. We just need the leadership that you know, lives up to this challenge. Thank you. Anatole, you know more about Pakistan than many of us. How would you react to these questions on Pakistan? Well, I mean, so, something that Pakistan has suffered from, from its inception um, is the, the inability to create a, an elite consensus behind essential policies. Mm -hmm. Um, now, by the way, I mean, that is affecting, you know, other places as well. I mean, the, the United States is increasingly crippled by this. Um, however, in Pakistan, the, you know, in, in the US, there are tremendous cultural ideological differences, you know, between the Republicans and the Democrats now. Uh, whereas actually, I mean, under all the shouting, there are not that many differences between the leading Pakistani political parties, except to some degree, of course, on ethnic lines. Um, but uh, I think one find, you know, if you look at countries which have managed to create successful reform programs, uh, in some cases, of course, uh, this has been through savage authoritarianism. I would not obviously recommend that in Pakistan, and I also don't think it would work. I think it would destroy Pakistan. Um, 
But in other cases, it has been possible for the different parties to agree on a set of basic, essential national measures, or for that matter, local measures. You know, in other words, you know, basically, let's shelve our differences over other things and build the damned roads or sanitation system or education system or whatever we can agree. And actually, we don't need to agree because everyone knows it's necessary. Mm. Um, but I mean, there is the lack of trust between the elites and the population, between the government and the population. There is the lack of trust among the elites themselves. Um, all I can say is that, um, well, two things, I suppose, um, you know, don't evade paying taxes, steal your electricity without paying for it, and then blame the government for everything that goes wrong, or the army, or indeed anyone else, but yourself, you know, trust is reciprocal. Mm. Um, the second thing is that, you know, trust grows through doing, in other words, um, you know, as Malia has said, this, this is not something which can be magicked into being uh, overnight. Uh, but, I mean, if you look at um, some of the countries in East Asia, including, as I've said, countries that have at least become democratic countries, uh, this, now, of course, the, the, the trust of the population in the state had older cultural roots, um, but it was also developed uh, in recent generations, you know, since the, the Second World War, by a steady process of state achievement, obviously economic growth, but then, you know, passing a sufficient degree of the benefits of that growth to the population in terms of services. Uh, and so, basically, you know, you, someone needs to get started on that. Um, I would also say that, um, and once again, I mean, I'm, I'm not just taking aim at Pakistan here because I, you know, I think one does see very much some of the same paralysis growing in, in the United States. Um, but there are aspects, you know, of the Pakistani system uh, which are, you know, closely related, of course, to the, the nature of the political system and to the nature of the patronage system in Pakistan. Uh, but the, the lack, you know, as far as the civil service is concerned, for example, I mean, Pakistan has, it seems to me, fallen crashingly between two stools. You know, on the one hand, it's still operating to a considerable extent on the old British generalist pattern, you know, of the ICS, uh, for, of civil servants who are supposed to be able to do everything basically and you know, move from ministry to ministry. Um, now that's okay if you leave people in the same positions for long enough that they really do become experts in their field. If of course you have a system of generalists who are also moved constantly at, you know, after a few months or even weeks to a new job, um, that is a recipe both for um, incompetence but also for irresponsibility. So, you know, Pakistan needs a more effective, trained, and apolitical civil service. Um, can any political government create such a civil service again? Maybe not, but I mean, that, that is something that, um, that Pakistan needs. Now, if one can, because, you know, if one looks at certain other countries around the world, Italy has always said, uh, been said to be uh, you know, an example of this. Uh, looking at Italian political governments, elected governments since the Second World War, one would have a, a political incoherence and instability, uh, which you know, almost on the surface makes Pakistan look good. Uh, but it hasn't, it hasn't mattered because a highly efficient, highly trained civil service has basically gone on running the country. You know and carrying out essential tasks, but, but you know, also carrying out essentially you know, basic reforms continuously. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, that's part of the, you know, the, the creation of an efficient state. Now, the other thing of course, is that if one can have a state which works well in that fashion, almost irrespective of, of who at the moment is sitting at the top, 
then it becomes possible to attract um, educated expert Pakistanis from abroad back to Pakistan and give them responsibility, give them important positions with a, with a capacity for decision. Because as I'm sure, you know, we've all found again and again, you know, tremendously talented Pakistanis working abroad, you know, in the West. They try to come back to Pakistan, they want to come back to Pakistan, they want to help, they come back and they find that even when they're given positions, there is essentially nothing for them to do. You know, they, they, cannot be fit, they cannot be fitted into the system in a way that would allow Pakistan to make use of its global, global resources of talent. I have, you know, at, at Georgetown in Qatar, I of course have many, many Pakistani students. And because they know I'm an expert on Pakistan, they know my book, they often come to me um, asking for advice on what they could, what jobs they could seek in Pakistan, you know, what they could usefully do. And it is absolutely tragic, um, the lack of opportunity for such people, unless of course they come from families. You know, which were already established. And of course, the great majority of them, especially the women, end up trying to move to the West, which is a, a, a dreadful loss for Pakistan. So, I mean, that's just one thing I've been saying for many years. Very good, very important. Harun Saab. Ji, I'll be quick and I will be simple. Uh, what I used to tell the Prime Minister when I was there, I will repeat. First of all, the capability of the state has gone very weak to deliver. People, the trust comes from successful transactions of anything. So I used to say that set up priorities, pick up three things which the state can deliver. How do you deliver? You insulate it from the regular system. You create space for people who have record to deliver that. People will start trusting you. I can, as you know, former head of investment uh, ministry, I can tell you that the international investor, as a matter of fact, without naming heads of state has told me and the prime minister that we want to put in X billion dollars in your country, but your bureaucracy will not be able to do it. Even people know it outside. So, you know, you generalists, as Anatole is mentioning, and the frequent shifts just for populist and, you know, personal uh, interests, I had three permanent secretaries in one year. Yesterday, we got fifth chairman of Federal Board of Revenue in two years. So the question is that this adds to the prevailing post-COVID uncertainty. The uncertainty is a killer for any serious business. You can't plan. You really don't know who's going to be there tomorrow. So I think you need to simply put in two, three priorities. For instance, I want to get rid of state land. I want to sell X number of sick assets, whatever. And then basically the people in a year, the progress is done. So what happens is that we have now that's linked to CPEC. What mm. CPEC has become, I was the counterpart for a year. It has become a wish list. Mm. We want to do everything under, you know, CPEC, right from agriculture to social sector development, to making roads and bridges, uh, industrial cooperation, economic zones. For God's sake, you just do not have the capability to do it. So we need to set priorities, just few priorities to deliver. And the question was that what should Pakistan do post-COVID in CPAC? So my answer is that since capability is further shrinking, resource base is shrinking, set one or two priorities and show to the world that we can do it successfully. That's my only message in terms of capability, rebuilding trust, and also attracting investment. Hey, thank you. I folks, can I, can I take another quick round of questions? And then you can ask the folks, lots of questions, hands are raised. So I urge you to be very brief so that we can move fast and get back to the speakers. Tahir Dinsa Saab. Tahir Dinsa. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear can my hear voice? Me. You can hear you. My question is to Anatoly Lebanon, and I'll ask a very quick question. Uh, at the start of the last century, when oil was found in the Middle East, you know, new geographies came in the countries, and OPEC was formed. 
that was trading with dollar that would bring a huge benefit to the us now tarik benori has calculated that if you harness the energy of 1 liter of gasoline that is equivalent to harnessing the energy of 15 labor men for two weeks and that basically produce all that now with the, with the climate change the oil has become useless us has kept its oil reserve in in their territory now they will remain there like someone stuck the notes and the they were demonetized and the rise of china do you think that we are giving everything to the covid and over the turn of the century the us is bound to go down and uh, that is the china chinese know that they don't want to fight a war and us also know that and they are bringing their forces uh, in in the south china sea okay. and the risk of war what do you say on that okay great tayyaba professor tayyaba professor tayyaba ji mike doctor sir uh, thank you very much uh, doctor sir for giving me this opportunity uh, yes i agree with the with this one speaker regarding the um chemical emergency but there is educational emergency as well so i just want to do that uh, to reform the all level of the mainstream education system uh, what we will do to over- overcome educational emergency especially in the current situation where the readiness level at all level is also the question mark thank okay. you doctor sir thank you very much anila yusuf anila yusuf Okay, I guess Anila Yusuf is gone. So let's take Dr. Ayma. Dr. Ayma. Uh, hi, um, thank you for letting me the chance again. I just want to ask, from what Anatol has said and what Dr. Maliha has said, uh, it seems like everything is uh, in a state of chaos, and there's a lot of corruption. There's stress, deficit. People are not doing what they should do, and nor is the government. I'm not really sure if uh, we need a strict dictator or we need a stronger democracy. How okay. is it all going to happen? Fair enough. Um, ये अपना क्या नाम है फरदाना बासी जी वाले कुम्भ संगोहे हाँ गोहे Uh, yes, I want to. Uh, I want to know about the uh, prediction. What you do uh, in uh, digitization in Pakistan? Uh, will the digital money be legalized? Moreover, online gaming is becoming an industry, and okay. the freelancing is another work from home thing that we can do uh, during COVID, and uh, of course, uh, because of unemployment, we can do it. Uh, okay. After, after COVID. Okay. And can we expect from this government to legalize earning uh, earning money? to internet and ease the payment issues with online earnings and also fdr registration and youtube and uh, okay. facebook monetization like that okay theek hai ji sara nizamani sara nizamani sir uh, hello sir can you hear me yes. go ahead go ahead Uh, assalamu alaikum sir my name is sarna zamani and i am a research scholar at applied economics research center i have three questions sir one is for climate one is for state intervention and one is for my own self i'll i'll try to make this as quick as possible uh, my first question for climate is that as reported by the economist in the first week of april daily emissions worldwide for carbon was 17% below what 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 they were last year the international energy uh, agency expects global industrial greenhouse gas emission to be 8% lower similarly um, despite the economic slowdown deforestation in the amazon is in brazil is increasing in fact it is 40% higher than it was last year at this time so this shows that the climate crisis is much too large to be solved by letting go of planes trains and automobiles even if people made these such huge changes in their lives this experiment has shown that the world still have more than we still have more than 90% of unnecessary carbon left uh so my question is will covid-19 force the political powers of the world finally believing in the power of nature and generally science and accordingly plan to plan the policies or will it stick to its profit making models of uh, fossil fuel on the expense of our futures will covid change this my next question is for state intervention in the coming time i think too yes, many questions 
jaldi yes sir in the coming time everybody will then agenda will argue that their the pandemic has proved their point right uh, the 2009 crisis politician failed to deal with the grievances of ordinary people so the demand for populism was on a rise so my question is what will this pandemic how will it impact politics and state intervention and my third question is for myself what will be the impact on the job market for those who are graduating on in 2020 like myself are we being counted in the unemployment rate what will our personal loss of this time look like thank you sir I'll answer that very quickly yes okay go ahead <laughs> okay let's have uh, kya kehte hain vakar ali sir vakar ali hello ji hello can you hear me i can hear you fine uh sir i have a question as we have seen and it seems from the news that uh, authoritarian regimes have done better in tackling the covid 19 does this trend have any impact on democratic regime and uh, are we am seeing uh, we are going to see another rise in populism theek hai theek hai okay ji i think now we'll have to close off after this so i'll just take two more questions after that we'll close off alia khan ji uh, thank you nadeem um my question is that um the transition from a two party to a three party uh, system in pakistan um has led to even more of political dissension and the talk of a social a new social contract or a new um economic contract seems to be waning uh, even faster and even in the times of the covid uh, pandemic on the other hand we see that the aid inflows are gushing in um even faster after the covid-19 uh, pandemic and sometimes i feel that uh, the aid dependency is not as much on the part of pakistan um alone but rather the donors also have an interest in keeping pakistan aid dependent uh, i would just like uh the panelists views on this okay ji acha ji i think ab uh, we have to stop this anila yusuf no more hands please i am not going to take any more questions okay anila yusuf assalam alaikum my question is how foreign policy of pakistan will balance its relation with us and china amid this china us confrontation acha okay okay chale ji let's go back to the panel malia do you want to start this time Okay, Anatol, why don't you take the questions? I I have I have I have started okay, already. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't unmute myself. Yeah. I, I'll take the question on trust. Uh, yeah. I think you know whether whether a, a stronger democracy would be better or an authoritarian system. Well, I think an authoritarian system, uh, ipso facto, uh, is not based uh, on consent, and therefore, as consent and performance, I regard as the twin pillars. Uh, on which trust can be built i would think that a stronger more participatory more open democracy but not one in which the elite comes and works democracy for itself uh, it has to work democracy uh, for the citizens so i mean i think you, you, the short answer to your question is uh, you have to have a stronger more genuine democratic system now the question about whether you know authoritarian uh, assist, uh, governments have done better in the pandemic i don't think that's accurate i think it's been uh, you know some democracies have done very well and some authoritarian uh, states have done very well i think it's it's boiled down to leadership rather than political system uh and where we've seen leadership as for example in new zealand uh you can see how well they have uh, dealt with it of course their problem was not as severe as that uh, in many european countries so i don't think it's about uh, you know whether one has done better or the other i think leadership that has been sensitive empathetic and i think the key has been a leadership that has listened to science and not to politics last a question that i will answer uh, i mean i think the others can then pick up the other questions is that uh, hmm. economic uh, dependence uh, you know it's in the interest of donors to keep you dependent 
but the, that, you know, I mean, the question is, what is it that you want for yourself? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what an external actor may want for you to achieve economic independence. You've got to be independent in terms of taking your own decisions. And lastly, I'd say on education, um, you know, you said what needs to be done. It's pretty obvious what needs to be done. On education, you need to uh, enhance public expenditure uh, on education, train teachers, because it's not just about money. Uh, you need to also have the capacity uh, so that if you are going to have bigger budgets for education, you have to ensure also that the money is not going into ghost schools, for example, that it's actually uh, also you're training uh, teachers as you go along. But you know, I don't think this is impossible. I just think that successive governments, including the present one, has simply not put education at the top of its agenda. Uh, whereas if you ask the people of Pakistan what they would want most uh, for their children, I think you will get a universal answer from everyone. I want education for my children so that they can do better in life. Education is the only way you can empower people. There is no other way that you can empower people uh, and make them employable. <laughs> So I think, you know, there are many ways in which you can raise the money also for education. A state that is serious about education uh, can raise the money. Uh, but I, you need to have first a political commitment. So I'll end there because I know that we have to close soon and I have to go to also. I have another commitment. Okay, fair enough. And at all, your turn. Well, uh, the, the question about um, the USA, China and war, uh, neither the USA nor China want war. Um, obviously, I mean, nuclear weapons alone make that a catastrophically dangerous thought. Um, and during the Cold War itself, uh, America and the Soviet Union also uh, avoided war, direct war, albeit on one occasion by a whisker. Uh, what I'm afraid of is, as in the Cold War, that US-Chinese rivalry will produce more proxy wars in other parts of the world. Um, and... I very much hope that will not be the case. Um, it also, it must be said, depends on responsible action by local actors on the ground. Um, on climate change, um, there is no magic bullet and no individual change, whether it's automobiles, planes, energy generation, alone uh, will improve the, the, the problem. Um, there has to be reform in a whole range of fields. But I think it's worth pointing out that the technology to do this is either already there when it comes to alternative energy, which has improved colossally in um, efficiency and profitability over the past generation, uh, or is in the process of pretty quick development, as in um, electric cars. China has a program uh, to move completely to electric vehicles by 2030. Now, we have to see what the effects of the pandemic economic crisis will be. But the Chinese obviously think this is possible. Uh, we can do it. And, you know, many governments around the world are beginning to change. The question is whether we can do it quickly enough. Uh, finally, um, on the question of um, state efficiency, uh, it, it would be unwise to ignore the degree. And of course, the Chinese are very discreet on the subject, but they've been sending, nonetheless, pretty clear signals. The exasperation of many Chinese with the state of the Pakistani mm. political system and its ability to, to get things done in the economic sphere. And when it comes to this constant changing of officials, and politicians. It should be noted as well that one thing that this also maximizes is corruption. Uh, corruption and irresponsibility, because uh, it, it, anyone who wants to invest has to pay again and again and again and again to a range of different people. And if the whole thing goes wrong, if it isn't built in the end, then there is no one person who can be held responsible. There are dozens. This is a fatal combination as far as uh, effective investment and building of infrastructure or education or anything else is concerned. Harun? Let me pick up three uh, things. Uh, the question uh, on digitalization, the post-COVID, 
I commented that this will become one of the China's priorities. So I hope, but that would mean we need to understand that what do we need out of digital economy? So at this point, there is a confusion. Uh, number one, do you want to use it for better service delivery? Number two, can you use it for state accountability? Number three, it's a commercial argument that at the moment globally, the exports of you know, IT related have really, really you know, crossed the exports of manufacturing sector. Do you really want to use the English speaking IT? We produce 26,000 graduates a year out of those I'm told, six to 7,000 are of world class quality. So then first of all, Pakistan needs to clear that on digital economy, what do we need? The bureaucracy's tendency is that they will come up with nice apps to actually give you information, maybe some licenses. It's the giving side. I doubt it if anybody would make actually any digital thing which will lead to state accountability. Uh, how am I doing? But my worry is I failed as chairman of the Board of Investment to set up uh, the first digital economic zone because there was very little appetite to support that whole initiative, you know, where you can scale up your digital side. So my take on digitalization is that the country needs to see that where is the best value for investing in digital thing. If you only want to look good and nice apps and WhatsApp and cutting down some of the corruption, that's fine, but Pakistan can do much bigger and much better. Hmm. Second part is the future of job market. I think uh, one young lady asked this question. And let me again say that the post, uh, in fact, the PIDE, very extant PIDE analytical notes, which I quoted, you know, in various places, it very clearly tells us that, you know, uh, the job, where the jobs are in Pakistan, who will be more vulnerable. But in future, there is an old school which keeps on thinking that traditional manufacturing sector will create more and more jobs. So I would like to challenge that and ask the graduates to look at it where future job, future of jobs, where are they going? They are actually, you know, the, I can name somebody, the owner of Gulama Textile tells me that one machine now replaces basically over 200 people. So what's happening is that with technology coming, the manufacturing sector will not be employing the jobs. In a country like Pakistan, it's going to be agriculture sector, services sector, and people with skills which are interchangeable. Now that leads to delivery of skills, which is a very, very serious question in Pakistan. Are we imparting uh, true skills? And that links to education, uh, uh, which Malia Lodi just mentioned. I think in education, we have three things since we are talking on that. One is outreach, and I think digital technology can help. And on a lighter note, for instance, how a typical bureaucracy think about outreach. So I asked the minister, I won't name him very recently, about the South Punjab province, that how quickly you're going to move. He said, well, we have received a huge budget of 20 houses for secretaries, a new secretariat, and basically lots of cars and buses, and we don't have money, so how can we make the province? So this is precisely the argument for education, that if you really want to look at quality, you don't need nice buildings, and you need to invest where the quality is. So outreach, teachers training, skills are three things. And please, please, please get out of brick and mortar. And the final question of Dr. Alia Khan on aid dependence. Still, there is a confusion among many journalists and commentators that the money we get from World Bank and ADB is an aid. It's actually not aid, it's loan. Let's be very clear. When I was in the World Bank, I used to challenge the World Bank and perhaps that's why I'm not there. I used to ask them that, what is a World Bank project? It is a country's project, you're financing it. But at this point in time, there's a narrative that there is this whole multilateral system. They have their own projects. They are hand-holding you and delivering that. So first, let's be clear, aid is shrinking. Uh, DFID is closing down, merging with FCO. So grants will finish from this side, other than some of the Chinese and other grants. However, the multilateral and other lending is replacing it, and that's where the influencing game is being played. So my question is that, uh, uh, and I will echo the same, it is up to you how you deal with it. So far, the nexus of this, what we call 
this cross you know uh, national uh, uh, international elite is that the, there is an excess between donor and bureaucrats which comfortably I, i'm actually astonished without naming the top leadership of the current government when they came in government when i joined they used to tell me that how bad aid and these institutions are now even prime minister mentions that adb endorsed my policy mm. so that tells you that who is advising you and what so you need to have some independent thinking in that and in nutshell again i would say that having a wide wish list of this thing is a good idealistic thing but pakistan needs to show one sector which develops i will again close on that message thank you very much folks i must commend the panel that we still have a huge number of hands raised but i guess i don't want to keep you here all night so i will have to close off this session there's too many things to ask and uh, i thank all of you for joining us and for making this panel so successful but just before we go i'd like to ask all of you one yes and no question for the sake of history so that i can keep it and challenge you in the future there is an old french saying two such change whatever I, i'm sure you can pronounce it better the more things change the more they remain the same at the moment covid seems to suggest that we have changed human behavior that we will always be socially distanced and we will stop hugging and kissing each other and doing all the usual thing that we used to and it also seems to suggest that multilateral institutions are going to change states are going to change we'll do, go back we'll develop a new form of doing business yes or no do you believe that we will change or will we return to business as usual malia mute mute unmute maliha i said i i, I doubt if uh, some of the factors that we discussed earlier mm. which preceded the pandemic i don't think the pandemic has produced anything new mm. it's what was already happening mm. that is going to continue okay so we'll continue yeah. okay go ahead anatol yeah i i i do agree with that i mean business as usual but business actually was already changing to some degree okay arun i will echo in the sense that an external shock will not change the way things are being done it is an internal process it comes from yourselves not from a shock and that we are witnessing that rationality is being clean board thank you very much folks that couldn't ask a question i apologize my personal apologies to you i've always tried to include everybody but this time i really thought we were going too far to, um, in terms of time so i apologize to you i think we've had a wonderful discussion yes there are lots of going changes going to take place yes we need to think through things a lot i think one thing that the donors or the aid establishment that has kind of dulled us into thinking and i think many of us are at fault too commentators also have dulled us into thinking that the world is fully predictable that we know how to handle the world and maybe it's nature or allah's way of telling us that hey don't get too cocky the world is not predictable and that things are going to happen as the americans say the shit is going to hit the fan so be prepared unfortunately that means we have to build thinking states and thinking policy that anatol you put your finger on it we cannot this has been the biggest failing of developing countries we cannot build thinking states and thinking policies and we will suffer for that so we will continue to muddle our way through things through covid through debt crisis through many things Thank you again panel and look forward to seeing you again soon all the best folks thank you to everybody bye bye